folks, and welcome to another episode of the Rural Sense Show. I am your host, the instructive scholar, Mr. Grant Dahl. Well, I've got a very distinguished guest on for you today. Uh, he's going to be talking about a topic that uh, really, uh, I think it's come to the forefront here very much, especially in the Catholic Church over these last couple of years. And uh, it's a topic that I keep hearing coming up on uh, other podcasts and other radio shows and so on, and in articles as well. And so I thought, you know, maybe this is a topic that we should just sit down and talk about, you know, and just see what the proper approach is to <clears throat> what uh, to what to do in this controversial time in both Christianity and in the Catholic Church. So uh, my guest today is uh, he's a professor from uh, the Notre Dame Graduate School, and uh, that's not the uh, <laughs> that's not the school in Indiana. That is a school in Alexandria, Virginia. And it's uh, it's connected to Christendom College, for those of you who uh, may know that name a little bit more. Uh, but he is a professor of history and theology, and he teaches at uh, Notre Dame Graduate School. Uh, he's also come to prominence lately with uh, this study program that he has on the history of the church called EPIC, A Journey Through Church History, a program that uh, I actually uh, took part in this uh, past year. And I found it to be very informative and uh, very well done. And uh, and I felt that it was something that, uh, hey, you know what, I should have this guy on board, you know, to talk about some of these issues today. Because it seems like we can always learn a lot from history and what's come in the back. So, <clears throat> so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please welcome to the show Professor Steve Weidenkopf. Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Grant. Thanks so much for having me on the show here. All right. It's a pleasure to have you on. So... Well, uh, why don't you give our audience just a, li a just a short background on yourself and a little you know a little bit about what got you into history and theology and those things. Yeah, sure. And uh, you know, just a, as a point of clarification, we've actually you know you made the comment earlier about uh, how we're not the Notre Dame School in Indiana, the University of Notre Dame. So we've actually changed our school's name. Um, we're the Graduate School of Christendom College. So to kind of get rid of the whole Notre Dame confusion partially, but uh, that Notre Dame thing came actually because uh, the school, the history of that is the school itself was an independent institution called the Notre Dame Institute that was founded by Monsignor Eugene Cavan back in the late. 60s, early 70s. He was a uh, Kavan was a professor at the Catholic University of America at the time when Charlie Curran was there, and during the whole descent uh, from Humanae Vitae by many of the faculty and, and students at the, at the university at the time. And so he eventually left this, the uh, Catholic University CUA and then founded this Notre Dame Institute, which was a, a school that he designed specifically to. Um, uh, to you know, to help ca to train catechists really, as well as uh, mostly religious at the time. And over the years, obviously, the religious uh, you know aspect in terms of religious coming to study to school had decreased and late to increased. So we were just this independent institute for a number of years, and then it was in '97 actually we we merged with Christendom College to become the Notre Dame Graduate School. And then, as I mentioned, now we kind of just shorten it to to the Graduate School of Christendom College. But that's a little bit of background, at least on where, where I teach. Um, in terms of, of myself, you know, I, I live here in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I've had an interest in theology and history, you know, as far as I can remember, especially the history aspect of it. I uh, was in a, a military brat. My dad was in the Air Force when I was growing up, so I had a focus on military history for a, a large portion of my life initially. And then um, actually when I was undergrad, I went to Syracuse University in upstate New York and took a series of classes on medieval and Renaissance studies. And it was while studying that period of time in Europe that uh, I saw the, uh, you know, the influence of the Catholic Church, uh, the importance of the Catholic Church, and and the and that kind of interested me or got me going into the the whole subject of church history, um, you know, which I've pursued, read extensively on, um, and then eventually I got my master's degree in theology uh, back in two thousand one. Uh, from the same school which I teach at now. So um, this is a little bit about me and, and about the school. Very good. I, <laughs> you, you, you kind of put me on the spot there a little bit because uh, I'm a Christendom alumnus myself. So uh -huh. <laughs> I should have known that the credit <laughs> school changed his name, but shows you how much in touch I keep with that place. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think it's really only over the last year or so that we've we've noticed that. And frankly, myself, I noticed that you know from the website change and things like that and others. So it's not, uh, you, you know, I, maybe I guess it's been maybe over maybe a little more than a year, year and a half, two years. I guess we've been trying to focus more aspects on that as we're trying to get, I think, a little closer identification with the undergrad campus. Um, and 
you know, dropping the Notre Dame part uh, kind of think uh, helps achieve that a bit. So anyways. Right, right. So, well, let, let's uh, <clears throat> let's jump into the topic that we have here because, um, I mean, I'm sure as you well know from, uh, from what we've seen since uh, Pope Francis was elected back in 2013, I mean, there's been – the, the church the church has really been rocked by a lot of stuff that's just been going on you know you know Pope Francis likes speaking off the cuff and stuff like that and there's just a lot of confusion and there seems to be you know like I mean and I've heard it said Pope Francis is not really a theologian and things of that nature but uh, you know but at the same time you know he is still the head of the church and it's very much uh, you know we still owe him that respect as head of the church and he still deserves to be listened to. And that kind of tied me into something that you bring up a lot, especially in that uh, uh, church history course that I took uh, just this past year, where you talked about a heresy called uh, conciliarism. Uh, I hope that pronounced that right. <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I just wanted to ask you, uh, what is con- conciliarism? Why is it a heresy? Uh, why is it a particularly dangerous heresy in many ways? Yeah, so uh, you're right. I mean, conciliarism is is a heresy, and it was it's a heresy. Basically, what it is, it's the belief that supreme authority in the church rests with the bishops assembled in, in an ecumenical council, rather than with the pope. Uh, so we can break that down. I mean, it's 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 this heresy that believes again that does not have supreme authority in the church, but rather the bishops assembled in an ecumenical council. They actually have greater authority than the pope in terms of governing the church. Um, and that's you know, obviously heretical. Uh, it was condemned uh, by by the Fifth Lateran Council in the early part of the 16th century. It's actually the council that ended right before Luther began his Protestant revolt. Um, but the reason for why this this heresy erupted and when it erupted, it erupted you know in the 14th century. Uh, there was a huge crisis uh, in the papacy at the time uh, with various things. You had the popes living in Avignon for a period of time, and you had what later became known as the Great Western Schism, where you had m- multiple anti-popes basically um and so there's this movement began of how do we how can we solve this these this situation where there's these multiple anti anti anti-popes in existence and one uh one way in which some people thought of how we could solve that was to place authority of of, for governing the church in an ecumenical council in the bishops gathered together and a more you know we would term it today not what contemporaries would would have used the term but you know more of a a, quote democratic way of of maybe governance uh rather than kind of a uh, you know a monarchical way of governing which is really the way the church is set up now but so why is this a a, a heresy well precisely because what i just my, my last comment there was that it denies the hierarchical constitution of the church right we as catholics know and believe that Jesus founded the church on Peter. Uh, He was called out specifically by Christ, given the keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth uh, among the apostles. So, you know, Christ founds the, the church on Peter. The apostles are united with him in the College of Apostles, this body of apostles. Um, and and so it's you have you know pope, you have bishops, you have priests, deacons who assist the bishops in their ministry. Um, but that's the hierarchical constitution of the church, and you have the laity. And that's we believe as Catholics, right? That that's divinely instituted by Christ, right? That wasn't some kind of uh, you know Peter and the apostles got together and figured out you know well you know what should the bylaws be for our, our corporation or whatever you know I mean it's not a corporation, right? It's not uh, this human construct, it's rather a divine construct. So therefore, anything that seeks to change that construct or change the structure of the church, which conciliarism does, uh, is is heretical. And it's particularly dangerous, I think, because um, you know what it what it you know the whole well, you have to kind of go back to whole, what's the whole point of the office of the papacy. I mean, Christ established the papacy to be a source of unity, right? That he wanted the apostles to be uni- united with Peter, right? To be in a communion, and so the church has to be in unity with his visible head on earth with uh, the Pope. And so if you if we try, try to change that or we try to place our, our unity in something other than that, like maybe this block of bishops as opposed to that block of bishops or what have you, uh, then you know we're not united. So conciliarism at its core, although it, it's, it attempts to 
uh, try to bring about unity, you know, bishops assembled in a council, it really is disruptive of unity because it violates the whole divine structure of, of the church to begin with. Um, and it calls into question many things, right? I mean, it, it can, in, one way in which it disrupts unity is, again, anytime that you have, you know, a disagreement with the pope, right, a couple of bishops or the, a group of laity could say, well, I don't agree with what this pope is saying, so, you know, let's call a council and we'll change what he's saying or we'll legislate differently or what have you. Um, so it, so it's, it can be very, very disruptive uh, in the life of the church. And it, it again, places that authority in, 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 a, in a situation or in, in a body, rather, of people that was never intended by Christ to have that level of authority and power. Yeah, that's, that's actually very, very interesting that you bring that all up <clears throat> because uh, – I mean, what one, it would seem to me that one effective argument that you could use against you know, this idea of consularism is that, you know, if Jesus had intended for his, you know, to have multiple leaders of his church rather than just the one, you know, he wouldn't have picked just Peter. Maybe he would have been having, you know, he would have been picking Peter, James, and John and, you know, tell the three of them, you know, I'll give you the keys to the church or something like that. Exactly. Or, you know, I mean, we, we could, you know, scripture, he could have just addressed the apostles as a whole, right? I mean, either as a group of them, like you said, or just as a whole, right? You know, to you, the apostles, I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth. But, you know, he didn't do that. So he, he specifically called out one particular apostle, Peter, and he is the rock, right? The foundation upon which the church is built. So um, it, it behooves us, if we believe what we say we believe, to, to uh, you know, understand and listen to uh, and to respect the, the structure that Christ has put in place. Right, right. Well, well, yeah, and so now that we've kind of set that there, I mean, like, uh, I mean, could you go through, you know, some instances in the history of the church where, you know, consularism was in play and what kind of happened, you know, in those particular cases where it came up and, you know, was, you know, particularly troublesome to the church? Yeah, so, I mean, I touched on it briefly in the last answer there. It was in terms of the 14th century. I mean, really, you have to understand the historical context to heresies. Um, and so the historical context to consularism in, in the 14th century was you have the, the, this real crisis in the papacy. I mean, at the beginning of the 14th century, you have, uh, you know, the papacy moving from uh, from Rome to Avignon, so this was an actual move of the residence of the Pope, right? The Pope no longer lived in Rome, but rather lived in Avignon in the south of France. Uh, a lot of that had to do with, with the political machinations of, uh, you know, the king of France at the time, Philip IV. But you have, um, you know, the, the Pope is still, you know, the Bishop of Rome is still the Bishop of Rome. He's just not living in Rome. So that's the, the ecclesiastical abuse of absenteeism, right, where a bishop doesn't actually live in his particular diocese. That caused all kinds of problems. As you can imagine, the Pope's lived in Avignon actually for uh, 70 years about. So – um, you know, we, we could just imagine today if Pope Francis decided that he didn't want to live in Rome anymore, he wanted to live in Buenos Aires or something because he likes Argentina better than Italy and, you know, the summers aren't so hot, maybe in humid, but uh, as they are in Rome. But, you know, it, that, that doesn't – he's still the bishop of Rome, right? He's just not living. He's living half a world away. So that's, that's – you know, we would find that problematic, and you can imagine people in the 14th century how problematic they would find that, uh, and they did. Right, and not only did the the laity, the regular, you know, let's say lay folk, find that problematic. You know, saints found that problematic as well. Theologians, uh, you know, and it was a real difficulty for Christendom, politically speaking, because you had multiple secular rulers who believed, because the pope is living in France, that he is somehow the puppet of the French king. Right, that the pope or the church is is supporting the policies and the politics of the French monarchy. Now. If you actually look at the history of the time of the papacy in Avignon, that wasn't the case. The popes in Avignon actually were still very independent, were not really the puppets of the French king. But that that you know perception still um, was, was persistent throughout Christendom, and it caused – ultimately what that caused was a weakening of support for the pope. It caused a lack of respect for the pope and a loss of prestige for the pope among the secular uh, leaders of Europe and obviously among – uh, the people of Christendom as a whole. Now, eventually, the popes come back from Avignon, and they go back to Rome, rather. And while they're there, uh, Urban the Sixth is newly elected. So the pope who brings them home is Gregory the Eleventh. He dies soon after he arrives back in Rome. Uh, the cardinals gather together. Now, obviously, you can imagine at this point in time, because the papacy had just been spending 70 years in France, the majority of the cardinals are French. Uh, so there's a there's a real fear among the Italian people 
that they will elect a Frenchman who will move the papacy back to Avignon, back to France. Uh, so they, they make it known that the, the Roman populace, as they want to do and throughout history, is make their needs known and their desires known. So they obviously make, make it known that they want an Italian to be elected pope. And so that's what happens. The cardinals do elect an Italian uh, who takes the name Urban VI to be pope. And Urban was very committed to reform, wanted to reform the church, but he he got very um, – uh, he was – I mean today we might say that he had an anger management problem you know, in terms of he could be very caustic with his cardinals, very severe. Uh, his heart was in the right place, but you know, his, his methodology was not you know, rooted in charity, I guess we could say. So that caused the cardinals to be upset, many of them. They decided a few months after they had elected Urban that they were going to gather together and declare that he had been elected – forcefully that they weren't free to elect him the roman mob had forced them to elect this italian pope therefore he wasn't really pope uh and they elected a new man to be pope who a frenchman who took the name clement the seventh now obviously the cardinals have absolutely no authority had no authority whatsoever to do that once a pope is elected he is pope until he either resigns the office or dies uh so they had no authority to do that but they did it anyways and so you have the situation that that later becomes known in history as the Great Western Schism, where you have one man who is the pope, you have another man claiming to be pope. Now, not the first time in church history you had an anti-pope. Actually, the first anti-pope was back in the third century, St. Hippolytus. Uh, so the church has had anti-popes in the past, so why was this a, such a great de a big deal? Well, again, it goes back to the fact that they were in Avignon for 70 years. You have this law, lack of respect, uh, you know, loss of prestige for the papacy, and secular rulers lining up to support whichever candidate they think is going to be more beneficial to them. So the political stakes are much, much more higher here in the 14th century than they had been in many other uh, cases or any other times throughout church history. So anyway, so eventually you have uh, you know uh, these popes or the pope in Rome. You have an anti-pope who then goes and lives in Avignon, and then eventually later too you have another pope, another anti-pope rather that's elected who lives in um, Pisa. So you ultimately at one point have three men claiming to be pope. Of course, it's very important to recall or to remember that there's really not three popes. Sometimes people say, oh, there are three popes, and really three popes. There was one man validly elected to be pope, and there were two men claiming to be pope, but they're not. They're anti-popes. Right? It's, it's a crucial distinction uh, that we need to keep in mind. So what happens, as I mentioned earlier, is that how conciliarism comes to play is that you have this whole situation of the Great Western system, multiple men claiming to be pope. There's much confusion in Christendom, secular rulers backing different candidates. The idea comes up from you know, the theological faculties of, of some of the major universities in France – or in uh, Christendom, rather – is to how can we solve this well – we should solve this whole problem by by uh, making the council, an ecumenical council, have the supreme authority in the church. That that way you won't have these multiple anti-popes, you know, or you know, multiple men claiming to be pope. You'll just have a council that'll have authority to govern the church, uh, and it can set, you know, um, it can legislate for the church. It can decide, you know, whether something is heretical or not. It can it promulgate various teachings. We don't have to rely so heavily on the pope, right? But again, as I mentioned earlier in the last uh, our last uh, question. That that's a heresy, right? It violates the, the hierarchical constitution of the church. So it was a big thing in the 14th century, the 13th century, and the early part of the 15th – or the 14th century, early part of the 15th century. Um, but once the whole crisis of the Great Western Schism was solved at the Council of Constance early in the 15th century with the election of Pope Martin V, um, conciliarism as, as a whole really kind of petered out because there was no real support for it anymore. Everybody backed Martin V. Um, you know, there were some decrees that came from the Council of Constance that called for f councils to be called frequently, um, and Martin V never, and, and subsequent popes really never, uh, never held to those those uh, those documents and never really implemented that in the church. So that's kind of how it, it that's the historical context of why it began, and also kind of how it petered out at the same time. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, and just to clarify something here is with, uh, in regards to that, that council, I believe you said it was the council of, uh, the council of Constance that yes. solved the great Western system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, cause I, I've, I know that to, to some, you know, observers who may not know as much history about the church as, uh, you know, as, as like you and me do, 
they may look at the Council of Constance and say, like, well, the Council of Constance solved it by removing all three men who were pope. It's right. like what? It's like what? How was that? How was that not conciliarist in nature? I mean, could you go into yeah. why it wasn't? Yeah, great question. So yeah, the re- so how the council? So we should back up a little bit and talk about what what an ecumenical council is and how they come into being. Actually, that that's a good good point. So, you know, an ecumenical council. There's been 21 of these throughout the 2000 year history of the church. Uh, you know, the first one was the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century. It discussed the whole heresy of Arianism. What an ecumenical council is 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 you know what we talked about earlier was its bishops assembled. You know, in a meeting to discuss matters important to the church of faith and and doctrine and even discipline, um, and there. But councils in Catholic theology have no authority without the active involvement of the Pope. So, the, meaning the Pope either has to call a council into being. Or he has to confirm the calling of council because many of the early councils, if you go through look at the history of the church, many of these early councils, uh, you know, in the fourth and fifth century and, and later, were called by emperors, not by the pope. But even if the emperor calls the council, for example, the Council of Nicaea was called by Emperor Constantine. The pope approves the calling of the council by either attending himself in person or sending his personal representatives to preside over the council. Um, so that's 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 how a council is uh, authentic: is ca- being called by the pope or at least being approved uh, by the pope. And then this, you know, the second thing is that the Pope has to, or his representatives have to preside during the proceedings, right? So uh, there's actual, you know, papal representation either in his person or in legates there at the council. And then finally, for a council to be authoritative, you know, the documents of the council have to be promulgated by the Pope. So it's the Pope and his teaching authority that that uh, you know kind of gives credence to and gives uh, prominence to. The teachings of a council. So the whole point of that is that the the pope, a pope is integral to the running of a council. So to the the particular question of the Council of Constance, how was that uh, not conciliarist? Well, you have to dig into the the details of the of the council a little bit more and realize that uh, the council did depose the two anti popes who you know uh, were obviously claiming to be pope. Um, you know, one of them, uh, you know, who uh, Benedict took the name Benedict the Thirteenth, who was living in Spain at the time, Pedro de Luna. He, Cardinal de Luna, he actually you know didn't abide by the decrees of the council deposing him and claimed to still continue to be pope all the way until he died. Um, but you know, it, it's like somebody saying that they're a Martian, right? I could say I'm a Martian doesn't mean I actually am from Mars. Uh, so somebody saying they are the pope doesn't mean that they actually are the pope. Right. right. Uh, so, so just though he continued to to say that doesn't mean he was he, he had been deposed. Um, but the real situation was Gregory the Twelfth. What he did was he was the actual uh, validly elected pope who was in Rome. He sent a representative to the meeting to the Council of Constance, which was again called by the by the emperor, Holy Roman uh, Sigismund. So he called the council. Gregory the Twelfth, who was the uh, legitimate valid pope sent representatives to the meeting at the Council of Constance and gave them a letter. And in the letter, the letter had two parts. The first part of the letter was Gregory, through the authority he had, obviously as Pope, saying that he recognized the calling of the council uh, and so therefore gave legitimacy to the council. Then the second part of the letter is as uh, what he did was he said for the goodness or for the good of the church, in order to solve this crisis, he then abdicated the chair of Peter. He resigned, in essence, the office of papacy so that the cardinals there could elect – or actually those assembled. It was more than just the cardinals. But those assembled at the council could then elect his successor whom all would agree on uh, in order to uh, – you know, bring about further unity. So again, so even in that action, even even though it appears on the surface to be, you know, oh, considerism kind of won the day, it, it really didn't because the actions of the council have no credence, had no credence, had no authority, if not Gregory, uh, you know, if not for Gregory giving the authority to the council to do what it did. Yeah, that's a very good answer, and that's I mean, that's that that does kind of clarify the point because without. Without Gregory's approval and resignation, there probably would not have been a solution to the council or to the Great Western Schism at that time. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it could it could have continued on even further and fractured the church even more, and uh, you know, produced all kinds of of difficulty. And and you know, the church recovered for a bit from the Great Western Schism and the whole crisis of the papacy in the 14th century. Um, as you get into the 15th century, but you know, really, a lot of the the seeds, you know, we could say were were sown for the Protestant Revolution. In later on in the 16th century, in this period of time in the 14th century, it really was this you know crisis of the papacy, as long as uh, along with some other um, uh, you know things, abuses and whatnot that crept into the life of the church that really um, uh, you know helped to contribute to uh, the rise of the Protestant movement in the 16th century later. But that's that's a topic for another another podcast. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. <laughs> so, okay, very good. Well, now let's let's kind of bring it forward a little bit because I mean, I'm sh- like I mentioned earlier, I I'm sure you've seen, you know, there's been a lot of dismay in the church today based on some of this, a lot of the stuff that, you know, Pope Francis says or the thing the things that he's seen to imply or the way that people, you know, interpret what he says and so on. You know, and I mean, I, I want to clarify just right here is like, I believe that his heart is in the right place, but you know, it was like, but at the same time, I also believe that, you know, you, people have said, I think even he has admitted that he is not a trained theologian per se. Like he's not really been trained in that. <clears throat> so I'd like to transition a little bit into doctrine here and just talk about, uh, could you clarify for us, you know, when is a Pope teaching doctrine infallibly and when is he not? Because I know that, even though you'd think that a lot of Catholics would already know this, sadly, quite a few of them do not. Yeah, that's true. And and you know, before I touch on that, just to give you the you know to hit on your your comment you said about Pope Francis not being a trained theologian or not seeing himself obviously if from having that formation and, and how people are reacting to him. And maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more and uh, towards the end of the podcast too, I guess. But. Um, you know, I think it is important for people to recognize that you know, uh, you know, not, not every pope has different gifts, right? Every pope has different gifts. Every pope has different um, things that they're going to focus on and different, you know, different priorities than than popes before them. And that's not a bad thing. That's that's just that's, you know, the needs of the church at the time are different from papacy to papacy, so to speak. Um, and I think that in many ways, Catholics, uh, you know, especially in the, maybe in the you know, more English speaking, you know, world, the Orthodox, you know, world. Um, tend to see, you know, we, we were spoiled in a certain sense, I guess I could say, right? We had JP two for a quarter century, who was one of the most brilliant philosophical minds of the 20th century, you know, and then followed and working closely with him during the pontificate, and then following him uh, in the papacy was, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger, Benedict the the 16th, who was again one of the greatest theological minds in the 20th century as well. So you have two kind of rock star you know, popes in terms of philosophy and theology, and then, you know, Pope Francis. And, the, and it's not to say that Pope Francis is, is dumb or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to draw that. I mean, he's a Jesuit, so he's highly trained, highly educated. He's a smart man. Um, but his emphasis, his training is different. You know, uh, you know, Karawatiya was a parish priest for a period of time, but, you know, was a university philosopher, a university professor. You had, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, Joseph Ratzinger was, you know, a theologian, an academic, um, you know, had very, very, very small time as a pastor, a pastoral ministry. Um, and then you have Pope Francis, who has, you know, his whole life basically was pastoral ministry. So he's approaching the papacy and the church from a much different perspective than the two men who came before him in the papacy. And again, not a bad thing. It's just a difference in uniqueness. And so we have to think, take that into account with how he conducts himself and can't expect – I think it's 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 irresponsible for Catholics to um, – to you know, expect the pope to you know each individual pope to be like some pope that they've liked in the past, if that makes sense. Um, but again, we can talk about that, um, I guess, later on. But yeah, no, what you what you, the point you make there is a very very solid one. It it's uh, I mean because you're you're right. Pope Francis does have a very different approach to the way he does things. He is more pastoral in nature than uh, that. He, he's more past. He's more of a pastor than a teacher. And in many ways, you know, I know that this is something that I've seen him do, and I think that this is kind of the one of the focuses of his pontificate is just teaching Catholics how to live the faith rather than just, you know, be able to spout off doctrines and so on, you know, and stuff like that. Because, you know, as you said, you know, we had JP2, we had Ben the 16th, and uh, they, you know, they were, they trained us in many ways. They trained my generation and a couple other generations, you know, on how to teach the faith and so on but pope francis it seems his emphasis is being is more in teaching us how to live it 
in many ways. Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's spot on. I mean, I, I like how you put that there. So, um, but to the the question at, at hand in terms of spouting doctrine, we need to take a minute and, and do that. And uh, you know, the you talk about when is a pope teaching infallibly and when he's not. I mean, the the, the crux of the the um, teaching is really to be found in two documents in terms of papal infallibility. Um, and so I'll just you know briefly highlight those. Um, the first is the, the first there in the first Vatican Council, which was in the, the late part of the 19th century, uh, issued a document called Pastor Eternus. And in Pastor Eternus, there is a whole um, you know section on papal infallibility, what it is, how it's exercised. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then following along Pastor Eternus later on in the 20th century with the most recent Ecumenical Council, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, uh, there's a document Lumen Gentium. Uh, which is a document on the church, and so the teaching of uh, the, the the teaching office of the papacy and the magisterium as a whole, the teaching authority of the church, is contained within that dogmatic constitution on the church, known as Lumen Gentium. So, those are our foundational documents. If anybody wants to learn more about these uh, or that topic, those were that's those are the two documents you turn to in the church's uh, teaching. Um, but really, you have to focus first before we say how does the church, how is the pope, or how do we know he's teaching something infallible, or how you know what's the process or the conditions upon which he has to uh, teach infallibility, we should take a step back and focus on the charism of infallibility itself and what it is and what it's not, right? So the charism of infallibility is a gift, right? It's a special gift of God given to the church uh, so that we know that certain things that are taught in terms of faith and morals, we know with certainty that they are true. Um, and that's the key distinction. Infallibility does not – the gift of infallibility doesn't make something true um, in, in terms of you know maybe we're, there's a doubt of whether it's true or not. It, it's really – it's focused on uh, certitude. right? It gives us – the gift of infallibility gives Catholics and gives the church the certitude to know that what is taught – uh, is absolutely true that there's not only is it absolutely true, but there's absolutely no uh, possibility of error in what is being taught. All right, so that's and it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's that's kind of the important point of what um, what the charism is. Right, when the Pope teaches infallibly, he's only making explicit what God has already made known to us through sacred tradition or sacred scripture, right? The Pope is not adding something new. The Pope is not creating new doctrine. Um, you know, rather he's giving us this, This he's definitively teaching, uh, you know, a, something, uh, you know, a teaching of the church, a doctrine, so that we know for certain that it's true, right? And, and infallibility can be exercised in many different ways. Um, there's an ordinary way to exercise this gift. There's an extraordinary way to exercise this gift as well. Uh, the gift can be exercised by the bishops uh, united with the pope collectively, or it can also be exercised by the pope himself, right? So there's many ways in which this charism can be uh, exercised. In terms of, we'll just talk about how it's exercised individually by the pope himself. Um, you know, these are frequently known as ex cathedra statements. Um, you know, he's teaching from the chair. And so what do we know about that? That this is an exercise of his extraordinary magisterium. He's teaching in a way that's extraordinary, right? There's an ordinary way that, you're, that the Pope teaches through his different documents that are that are promulgated and whatnot. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's that aspect of it. Then there's the extraordinary way. Uh, that he makes these infallible ex cathedra statements or pronouncements. And really, um, we have to focus that, again, this is something that's individually, it's a gift given individually to the Pope. So he, when he issues something or he teaches something infallibly, it's not uh, you know, something he's teaching from the consent of the faithful or from the consent of the bishops. He can use this charism without their approval. I mean, he hasn't done so in the history of the church, but he, in terms of meaning the bishops have supported what he has taught, but, you know, in the faithful as well, but it's not something that he needs their approval from, right, in order to to exercise. And these these teachings, you know, are irreformable, right? They cannot be changed by a a later pope, for example. Um, So, you know, one example, the most recent example of a pope teaching infallibly, ex cathedra, um, in an extraordinary way, was the pronouncement by Pope Pius XII back in 1950 on the dogma of the Assumption of the Blessed Mother. Um, you know, that was uh, – it's an irreformable teaching. So, you know, Pope Bennett or Pope Francis tomorrow – you know, of course he would never do this. But he couldn't tomorrow wake up and say, you know, I think 
Pius XII was crazy. You know, Mary didn't really wasn't assumed into heaven. You know, uh, I'm going to abrogate that teaching and say that that's not you know an infallible teaching of the church. He can't do that, right? It's an infallible pronouncement. Um, it's irreformable. So how do we know that the that the Pope is is exercising his his in an extraordinary way the charism of infallibility? Well. Pastor Eternus and Lumen Gentium, our source documents, give us the six conditions upon which we know or that he has to meet in order to teach something infallibly. The first condition is he has to be speaking and teaching as the universal teacher of the church, right? Not just as the bishop of Rome uh, for the diocese of Rome, for example, but he's speaking for the universal church as teacher of the universal church. He then exercises – the second condition is he has to exercise his – he's exercising his supreme apostolic authority. This is not just authority that's given to him again as the diocesan bishop of Rome, but rather the the keys given to Peter, right, to, to the successor of Peter. That's the authority with which he is using uh, this teaching. Uh, to make the teaching rather. The third condition is it has to be a personal act, meaning it's a free willed act of the Pope, right? He's not being coerced um, by someone, you know, the you know, theoretically some the bishops of Germany or something aren't holding a gun to his head saying you have to do this. Um, right? It's his own personal, non coerced, free willed uh, act. And it's not a ratification of something, which I talked about earlier, right? He's not, you know, ratifying some opinion or some document or something that that somebody had presented to him. It's it's his own personal act. He has to. The fourth condition is he has to intend to define whatever the teaching is that he is presenting as irreformable, right? As infallible. The fifth one is he has to uh, promulgate that teaching, right? It can't just be something he holds in in the silence of his heart, for example, or something he writes down but then doesn't publish. It has to be promulgated. He has to make it known to the universal church what this teaching is. And then the last condition is obviously it has to be on the subject of faith and morals, right? Many people confuse infallibility with you know somehow everything the Pope says is uh, you know true. I mean that's you know or, or uh, um, you know irreformable. I mean if the Pope is speaking on a political matter, for example, um, obviously there could be faith and morals that are that are that could be tied into a certain you know doctrine of the Church, obviously, um, or or moral teaching of the Church. But if it's not of you know faith and of morals directly, it's not necessarily um, you know something that would fall into that category, right? There's a little gray area there, a little bit of, of ability for for debate and discussion on certain subjects, um, but not if it's a matter of faith and morals, right? So you can't, as a as a good faith believing Catholic, for example, um, call into question whether or not the dogma of the assumption of the Blessed Mother is true or not. It is true. We know for certain it's true. Therefore, it must be believed for the sake of our salvation. Does that make Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah, no that that, that makes that makes perfect sense. Although, I mean, like, I would like to build off your answer there a little bit, just to clarify, because I know uh, some uh, some Catholics and Christians that I know uh, they tend to look at the the papal encyclicals and the apostolic letters and stuff like that that popes put out, and they tend to look at those as infall as infallible doctrine. That the Pope is that now putting out and publishing for everybody to read, and I know that this question has come up recently. With I'm sure you're very aware of, you know, Pope Francis's. Uh, I think it was an apostolic letter, uh, Amoris Le, uh, Laetitia. I, <laughs> I might have butchered that, but um, but you know that that question has come up, you know, because of the controversy surrounding that apostolic letter. So would you could you go into a little bit, you know, like where where do the encyclicals and apostolic letters and you know, maybe the uh, the the noon time uh, the noon time sermons and things like that. Where do they approach infallibility, and where do they not, or are they not, or are they just personal teachings not related to infallibility at all? Yeah, so that's a good question. So you know, a lot of it has to do when you talk about. You know, there's different kinds of documents, right? So that the that is it, that the Pope issues or he promulgates. There's encyclicals. Uh, there's, as you mentioned, apostolic letters. There's, um, you know, there's all kinds of things. There's apostolic constitutions. There's, you know, various kinds of 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 different documents. And so it's important to know. You know what is the document that that people are quoting from, or that the Pope is issuing, and why is he issuing it? You know, some of them, like you mentioned, Morris Laetitiae. I mean, that 
that was, you know, a document that resulted from a synod that was held, right, where the the Pope invited bishops from around the world to come to as representative bishops to come around from around the world to come to Rome to discuss, you know, matters of of the family and whatnot. Um, and then, uh, you know, as a result of that synod, he kind of encapsulates some of the the, the thought and the discussion of the bishops uh, at the at that synod, and then publishes a document based on the proceedings, you know, of that in his own reflections uh, of the Senate as well. John Paul II, you know, did this as well. He issued apostolic uh, exhortations, they're called, um, and all kinds of things. So, you know, there's there's a different way to associate with things. Obviously, encyclicals, uh, as terms of a papal documentation, carry the most weight in terms of uh, importance, and that we as Catholics should be very uh, focused on whenever a pope issues an encyclical and read to read that encyclical and to understand what those teachings are contained within them, because that is something that comes directly from the heart of the pope himself, right? Something that he's not he's not issuing it as a result of a meeting of bishops, or you know, a, a other uh, you know some other kind of maybe uh, you know special event or whatnot. This is something that he believes is very important uh, that he wants to share with the church, to, or it's, you know that we or he's teaching on a particular subject. We need to be aware of it. So need to, to give slightly, you know, give more credence rather to an encyclical than say an apostolic letter. Not that you blow off the apostolic letter, but, you know, in terms of weight, what's contained in encyclical is, is heavier than, than it's not apostolic letter. Now, the Pope, as I mentioned, I mean, the charism and fallibility can be exercised in ordinary and extraordinary way. And so um, we talked about extraordinary. I mean, ordinary way, uh, you, you know, it's, it's even uh, bishops, right, can teach things infallibly in an ordinary way. They can't do it individually. Though they have to do it collectively in communion with the Roman Pontiff, uh, and amongst them, they have to you know have communion with themselves first of all what they're teaching. They have to preserve communion with the Roman Pontiff. Again, it has to be a matter of faith and morals, and they have to agree that whatever the particular teaching is has to be held definitively and absolutely by the faithful. Good example of this, uh, this exercise of the an infallible exercise of the ordinary magisterium. And what I mean by magisterium, again, for your listeners who might not understand that, is is the teaching authority of the church, right? It's the authority given by Christ to teach uh, in his name, uh, you know, the, the on matters of faith and morals, right? The the, the teaching, the, the, the positive of the faith. So um, a good example of, of the ordinary, uh, infallible exercise of ordinary magisterium would be, for example, the resurrection of the Lord, right? I mean, uh, that is is obviously a doctrine that we believe, right? That Christians, Catholics have believed from the very beginning. Um, you know, you can you have accounts of the resurrection in the scripture, but obviously that's something that um, every bishop, right, in union with the, with the pope um, believes is or, or teaches, right, that is true. Uh, we know it to be true, and so therefore we have to uh, agree to that. We have to to um, you know follow that as faithful Catholics. Um, another example, perhaps a little bit more recent, uh, that is in some debate among different theologians, but um, you know at least most of the theological commentary and opinions that I've read on this is is are pretty um, united in that. The, the whole concept of reserving priestly ordin or the teaching rather reserving priestly ordination to men alone, uh, you know, John Paul II issued, I believe it was an apostolic uh, letter. It could be a different. Uh, it wasn't encyclical. I know that, but um, known as Ordinatio Sacra Totalis, and in that he he talks about the whole reason for uh, reserving priestly ordination to men. You know, why Jesus picked men. You know, he goes through some of the, the um, questions or comments that people have about that in terms of, you know, well, maybe that was just the cultural time in which Jesus lived. That's why he picked men. I mean, that's all addressed in that letter. Um, but when you look at the specific article in that letter where he he teaches on it, he he clearly indicates that he's teaching as the universal uh, shepherd. It's a matter of faith and morals. He says the teaching should be definitively held by the faithful. Not, a, not an ex cathedra you know, statement and an exercise and an extraordinary way of, way of his charism and fallibility. But because that teaching has been uh, held – you know, from the beginning, it's all the bishops in union with the Pope hold this teaching. The Pope himself is teaching this. It, he's making known for certain that this teaching that the church has has held for centuries 
is definitively true, one could, as I mentioned earlier, one could argue that that was an, an, an infallible exercise of the ordinary magisterium. So, um, but again, to your point, not everything that a pope writes, not everything that a bishop writes, for example, you know, obviously um, not every press conference that he holds is, you know, full of infallible statements. Um, but we know if, if you know, something is, uh, you know, is important based on you know, the emphasis on which the Pope decides to teach on the subject, how frequently he teaches on the subject, um, you know, then we need to take we need to take care to to, uh, you know, focus on what the Pope is saying and try to understand what he is, is saying and approach it from a reverence from a reverential perspective. OK, no, that's that's a very, very good uh, explanation there. It kind of uh, relieves the mind when you know that, you know, there are, that, you know, just because that, that some of the things that Pope Francis says that may not be completely clear, you know, it's like if he's not using the ordinary infallibility, then, you know, you can take what he says with a grain of salt. Would, would you agree with with that analysis there or is there a different perspective you would take to that? Yeah, no, I would say I think that I wouldn't necessarily say a grain of salt. I mean, in terms of, um, you, you know, when, he, for example, like he's giving a press conference on the airplane. I mean, John Paul II did this as well. You know, most recent popes have done this. Um, you know, what a pope says in the press conference is does not carry the same weight as when he issues and promulgates an encyclical. Right. I mean, that's so although the subject matter might be the same and maybe he mentioned maybe he's talking about I'll just throw a comment or a um, you know, topic that's that's obviously on everyone's mind now is immigration. I mean, maybe, you know, there's some comments that are made on the airplane about immigration or about, you know, uh, various policies, national policies and immigration, what have you. Um, you know, those won't carry the same weight as if the pope decides he's going to issue an encyclical on immigration and how, you know, that ties into various our various understandings of the moral life and moral teachings of the church and various past histor historical circumstances of it or whatnot. Um, you know, an encyclical on the subject, again, carries much more weight, might not be infallible, but carries more weight that we need to uh, pay attention to, that we owe submission of mind and will, or not necessarily submission, we owe assent of our mind and will to, meaning that we, um, I guess the best way to put it is that in theology, uh, you know, you as you study theology, there's, you know, a great um, theological axiom that the presumption of truth rests with the magisterium. Right. So if if you're studying when you're studying theology or if there's just a doctrine of the church that you struggle with or that you question or you have a hard time accepting, uh, the presumption has to be that the doctrine is true and your opinion is is not, you know, that you're, you can struggle, you can question. Um, that's all good. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to it. That presumption of the truth rests with the magisterium. The magisterium is teaching authentically. Your opinion on it is is not authentically. So it's the same thing I think with the Pope, in that you know we have to presume that when the Pope speaks, right, he is speaking. Uh, we have to presume the good, I guess, of the Pope, right? We can't. Uh, too many times I see different you know people commenting on the social media sites in particular about what Pope Francis says and this and that, um, and. You know, a lot of it is done from a perspective of real antagonism, right? That they, uh, it's not done from a spirit of fraternal uh, charity. It's not done from a spirit of presuming the good of the Pope. Um, and I think that's very important that we have to have that presumption. Um, you know, so again, not that you know every comment that that comes out of his mouth from on a, on a press conference or talking to some reporters or even written in a in a book that's just published, um, you know, in in the larger world. And JP two had many of those. Um, you know, they don't that doesn't carry the same weight, nor does it require the same level of assent on our part. Um, as something that would be issued in an encyclical, for example, or obviously something uh, an ex cathedra statement issued infallibly. Okay, now that that makes that makes a lot of sense, and that's you know, and that and that does kind of give some clarity to you know to you know as you said some of the you know more controversial things that Pope Francis might say in an interview or something like that, you know, and, and just things of that nature. And and actually, that's a good segue into the into the next question that I want to ask because you've already touched a little bit on you know some popes have been quoted in interviews and certain audiences and what have you. You know, it's just saying things which, you know, as you said, 
probably more their personal opinion than church teachings, or they're at least problematic where church teaching is concerned. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, what Pope Francis said in Amoris, uh, Amoris Laetitia or in, uh, you know, what he says in an interview or something like that. I know that there were uh, some of the interviews that John Paul II and Benedict XVI gave, you know, there may have been some Catholics who, you know, politically probably lean more towards the left that they had issues with of some kind, you know, but when we get in and on, and we know that the modern day media and, you know, a lot of the intellectuals and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, many of whom have antagonism towards the church or at least towards church authority figures, they, you know, they like twisting the Pope's words. They love twisting the, what the church says to their own benefit in many cases. Uh, you know, so we all know that there's a lot of disinformation that goes on out there about what the Pope says, but, you know, you know, building off of this though, you know, if, you know, in cases where a pope does hold a view which might be problematic, where church teaching is concerned, whether it's from the right or the left or whatever it is, you know, I, there's a lot of Catholics who seem to take this, you know, this uh, attitude which seems very conciliarist in nature, you know, of being, oh, you know, I'm holier, or more faithful than the pope, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, in just based, you know, theologically and practically and everything, you know, it's like, what do you see as being a better attitude for somebody who really desires to be a faithful Catholic and faithful to the teachings of the church, what would be a better attitude for them to take? I know you've kind of addressed this a little bit already, but I'd like to expound on that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, some of what I said in the in that last uh, question, I think holds true here in terms of, especially the latter part of what I said in terms of, you know, presuming uh, that that the good of what the Pope says, right? That that you know, we if we don't if we struggle with something that the Pope might comment on or say, um, you know, again, if he's giving a conversation to a journalist or he's he's you know issued a you know or published a book that's not you know of a of a authoritative teaching document like an encyclical or something like that, there there is some you know there's obviously some ways in which we can we can disagree, um, but you know we should always do so with what the Pope is saying, but we should do do so respectfully, right? And we we have to understand too that that there's there's a danger. I think um, I put it this way: there's a danger. I think in trying to see our faith or or um, you know kind of view the things of the church and of the pope through political lenses, right? If that makes sense. I mean, too often I think that that you know, uh, especially in America where the politics dominates you know our national conversation so much. Uh, and there's so much, you know, animosity really uh, concerning our national politics in many quarters that that many Americans, I think, are, are focused on, you know, kind of seeing things in the church from a left and right. And it's not just Americans, it's others, but, you know, seeing things from a left and right perspective or a conservative and orthodox or a conservative and liberal perspective or what have you. And, you know, those are not necessarily I mean, those those are terms that can be those are identify, you know, identifying terms which can help us. In terms of discussion, to try to categorize, you know, a perspective or a way of thinking, um, which could be helpful again for discussion purposes. But we really have to be careful of of uh, putting ourselves into this camp of, you know, I'm a conservative Catholic or I'm a liberal Catholic or this. I mean, they're really. Frankly, you know, honestly, there there is no liberal or conservative Catholic. I mean, you know, there's you can be orthodox, you know, but I mean, there's Catholic and there's not. I mean, either either you know, we either we agree with the teachings of the Church, um, you know, and we presume the good of of the Pope, or or we don't. Um, you know, and again, there's some wiggle room on various, you know, in circum in circumstances and various uh, things that are said that we can disagree with and we can question, and all that is very good. But at the end of the day, we still owe, you know, that that uh, that religious submission of mind and will to the teachings of the church. Um, so we have to, I think, as a laity, we have to also, in particular, laity, we have to. And I know many lay members of the church, you know, have experienced you know difficulty with various, um, you know, bishops or even with priests and things that they teach or things that they say or not very, or you know, even the way they celebrate mass, for example, you know, are not, um, uh, you know, not orthodox or not in keeping with the rubrics, let's say. Uh, but that doesn't automatically, you know, we need to be careful of like just labeling people, right? We need to understand that, you know, maybe. Um, you know, Father So and So, you know, who gave a questionable homily or taught something that, you know, or, or made a comment about some a teach, church teaching that was somewhat problematic. Um, you, you know, maybe it's not done from a a you know uh, 
a level or, uh, of animosity, right? He's not doing it because he's angry with the church or he's trying to drag people to hell, for example. He's just, uh, you know, maybe he's malformed. I mean, you know, my personal experience, I worked for the church in Colorado for a number of years, actually. And, um, you know, there were some very, very good priests and very, very good permanent deacons in the diocese as well. But there were others who, you know, just hadn't, and this is true of any diocese in the country and throughout the world probably, you know, men that just had, did not have the formation that they should have had uh, and were, conf- you know, weren't, you know, either didn't know the church's teaching fully or had been taught erroneously something. Uh, and we're only, you know, so we can't, so a lot of it has to do with, with, um, Understanding where people are coming from and trying to, you know, correct them, uh, you know, in a charitable way and in a fraternal way uh, when needed, but but not always looking uh, it from a perspective or having a perspective that you know uh, that they're always wrong. Does that make sense? I mean, like you know, we can't just always think if you disagree with some of the things that Pope Francis says, you know, in a, again in a non-authoritative way, some press conference or some you know journalist interview or whatever he gives. Um, you know, instead of just you know, kind of writing the pope off and saying, "Oh, he's a liberal," right, or whatever, we need to we need to kind of maybe take a little bit more time and focus on well, what exactly is he saying? Why did he say it that way? Um, what can I perhaps learn a bit from what he is saying? Um, this seems to contradict church teaching. Is it really contradict church teaching? Well, let's look at it in more detail and see if it does. Um, you know, and the other important point I want to make on this is this. A lot of times what's reported in the secular media is not always accurate. I know it's a shock to most people, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, especially when it concerns the church. I mean, most major news organizations, you know, in the English speaking world now do not have dedicated uh, religion reporters. And if they do, they have, you know, they have to cover a whole multitude of different faiths, for example. And they might they're not theologians, so they don't even know the intricacies of the different teachings of, you know, our faith in particular. Um, so you have to take with a grain of salt what's reported in the secular media. So what I always like to try to counsel people is, you know, you read something that that, you know, a headline that says, you know, Pope says this or whatever. Um, First of all, don't just take that headline for a fact. You know, uh, read the article, uh, but also necessarily necessarily take the article too, because you know reporters can take quotes and, and you know craft a story and a narrative that they that they want. So the better thing to do is to try to find the actual text. You know, all the press conferences that the Pope has, um, you know, or events that he's at. You can go to the official Vatican website and and get. You know, a, uh, a a transcript um, or at least an official statement, and you know from the Vatican, and you can read that yourself. So read those, read the actual text. Go to the primary source document um, before you start flying off the handle and saying, you know, and criticizing the Pope for things that the New York Times says that he's saying, because maybe he's not really saying that, or the Times is kind of twisting his words a bit. Um, you know, not that that would occur, right? Of course it would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, everything you say there may, may, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, that's – I kind of I, I kind of relate there to that comment you made about, you know, it's like people taking a headline and running with it. You know, it's like that's – that, you know, it, that's, I, I always tell people – I'm the same as you in that I tell people it's like, well, did you read the headline or did you actually read the article? It's like – and if you read the article and the article gave you that perspective, did you read the source document? You know, and stuff like that, because, you know, it's like, you know, <clears throat> because, yeah, you're, you're right. The, the, we all know how, how much the media twists things. And, you know, it's like, and, you know, the, the especially in America and many countries in the West, you know, the media is actually openly hostile to religion, especially the Catholic Church in many ways. And so they are, and so naturally it is to their benefit to try to make, uh, to try to sow division in the church as much as they can. And I think anyone who reads you know, about the stories about the church or about what Pope Francis says or about, you know, whoever Pope Francis' successor, whatever he says, or, you know, it's like, or they come up with something that Pope John Paul said, you know, way back or something like that. You know, it's like, you should always take that with a grain of salt when it comes from the news media because they always are looking for the sensational. I mean, I, I worked in the news media for about six months and I, I know that for a, for a fact that, you know, it's like they're always looking for the sensational. It was like, yeah, 
Yeah, they're looking for click, you know, clickbait and those kinds of things. I mean, it's all driven by you know, you need to have page views and things like that. And you know, the other the other thing to keep in mind too is is just you know, I mean, being pope, right, is is a, is a difficult job. I mean, it's a difficult thing to do. I mean, nobody in their right mind wants to be pope. I mean, we've had popes in the church's past who actually really really wanted to be pope and they were a disaster at it. But you know, I mean, any any good um, you know faith filled virtuous you know man of Christ. Um, would tremble at, at the thought, the mere thought of of having that level of authority and responsibility, uh, because you know, again, I mean, presume that you know these men obviously are you know faith believing, and you know they're going to meet their, they're going to go to judgment, right, as we all are, and they're going to have to answer, right? The, the responsibility of that they have been entrusted to them is so much greater than it is for you know, let's say the average myself or you or the average Catholic in the pew, right? So. Um, you know, we have. I think we have to take a step back too and recognize that you know there's a lot of pressure in that office. There's a lot of responsibility in that office. There's a lot of grace that goes with that office as well. Um, but you know, try to put yourself a little bit in the shoes of the fishermen. And and you know, if I mean, think about how you know uh, you get journalists asking you questions left and right, and you know, and they're not always asking questions as you point out from from a you know benign perspective. I mean, many times there are people who have you know a, a malignant or orientation toward the church to, to towards the church you know and they nothing would make them more happier than to see you know the pope slip up or say something like that they can turn sensational or whatever um and so you you know you have to be constantly on your guard for that too and we just and you know i mean popes in the modern world have have to deal with so much more access and so much more um attention on their everyday doings and their everyday uh, speech than popes at any other time in history, and that's true for you know secular rulers and everything. It's not just related to the pope, but you know these are all things that that we need to, to try to keep in mind and not um, and be a little less, um, I guess what's the word? I mean to be a little be a little less critical and try to be a little bit more um, understanding. You know, um, again, not not saying that we just you know accept everything that's said, but you know if there's something you disagree with, again, uh, read it, investigate it, try to understand it a bit more. Um, you know, but develop a well reasoned, rational, thought out argument for for why it is you disagree uh, on something the Pope says, rather than just you know, oh, he's a liberal Pope and, and calling it that. You know, there's more to it than that. Right, right, and <laughs> just building off your point a little bit there, there's a reason why when the new pope is chosen that the room that he goes into to don the papal robes is called i think it's called the room of tears yeah it's mm -hmm. like there's a reason for that because you know because of the enormous responsibility that comes from leading you know the billions and billions of catholics worldwide and not to mention uh it just what built up another point that you just made there about you know people who have actively sought the papacy and been disastrous you know it's like it, it brings to mind a quote from uh uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings, where he said, uh, you know, one of the most inadequate jobs of any man is to lead other men, and the ones who are least suited for it are the ones who actively seek it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, it, you know, it, it really has to be, you know, the, the, and I think this is especially true in the case of the church, the leaders of the church have to be reluctant leaders, you know, those who are called to serve, because as, you know, as Christ showed in his own time on earth, you know, he didn't go about seeking a crown. He didn't go about seeking to become king. He sought to be a servant to those who followed him. You know, and the Pope is kind of required to do the same. I mean, it's like, because, you know, Jesus, I, I forget his exact words, but Jesus said, you know, it's like, what I am doing for you, I expect you to do for others, and so on. And I think that especially applies in the case of the Pope. You know, it's like, and I think that that's something that, you know, a lot of modern day Catholics should keep in mind is that, you know, it's like, the, the modern popes that we've had, especially through the 20th century and you know now here into the 21st century, they truly have sought to be servants. And I don't think you need to look very hard to see that Pope Francis is trying to embody that, you know, that image more. I mean, not to say that John Paul II or Benedict XVI didn't do that, but Pope Francis seems to embody it a little more visually than they did, you know, with some of the things that he does. You know, as as Pope, you know, like going to the prison and washing the prisoners' feet and things of that nature. So, 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's uh yeah, and and you know, like I made the comment earlier that you know we have to always keep in mind that you know again, popes have different different agendas, different things that they different perspectives maybe is a better word that they of things that they want to emphasize, uh, and you know a lot of it has to do with with you know them taking stock of where they think the church is at the particular moment in time and what needs to be a focus, what needs to be an emphasis. Um, and you know, I mean, and I'm, this is just obviously presumption on, on my part. I, I don't presume, presume to know the inner workings of the minds of uh, the mind of Pope Francis. But you know, I mean, we you had the the solid philo- philosophical and theological foundations laid by his predecessors, um, you know, for the modern world, all stemming from the grace of the Second Vatican Council. Um, and so maybe, maybe, and again, just totally my opinion here, my presumption that maybe he he sees that and he recognizes and knows, you know, that okay, well, you know, the emphasis doesn't have to be on, you know, a constant reiteration of doctrine. Not that that's not important; it is. But maybe the emphasis, as you put it earlier, needs to be more on, you know, living the faith, taking this doctrine, this philosophy that we have, uh, and actually embodying it and fleshing it in the world. And I, you know, me, the Pope, you know, I, the Pope, we have, I have to illustrate that, you know, again, just my, my own thought. But, but you know, so we got to, we try to have to kind of see, I think, the papacy in those kinds of perspectives um, and not get so, you know, wrapped up on, you know, this particular statement or that particular statement or what he's doing today or what he said here or what he said there and, um, you know, no matter who the Pope is, right? We just need to have that greater sense. And and the other thing is, is you know, just to make one more point on it, is, um, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years of studying church history is, and what, what I've grown an appreciation for, is the, the absolute gift of the Holy Spirit, right? The a greater appreciation and a greater devotion uh, should come from, to the Holy Spirit, should come from a study of church history because, um, you know, if you just if you look at all the things that have happened in the life of the church and the, the sinful yet redeemed creatures that, that comprise it, um, without the gift of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit guiding, guarding, and animating the church, right? The church would have collapsed centuries ago, um, but it hasn't, right? Because Christ promised that he would always be with the church. He would send the advocate. And so we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so many times, you know, to be to speak more, you know, colloquial, I mean, we just need to chill out, right? We just need to calm down and realize that God's in charge, the Holy Spirit's in charge, and everything's going to be okay, right? The church has been through worse. Uh, it's been through similar things. It's going to be worse and similar things in the future. You know, that's really not our concern. Our concern is how can we be the best disciples of Christ in in the, in 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 our own small world and our own little community that that God has given to us. Uh, that should be the focus. Yes, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly there. So, and now, I mean, I want to transition a little bit here into, you know, just some of the things that are coming up because you know, I know that just, you know, just, just hearing what, what, you know, some of our fellow Catholics and what even some Christians have said. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know that, you know, there have been a couple of cardinals who have even, and, and bishops who've even, you know, voiced some questions on this, uh, you know, Obviously, with the controversy surrounding, you know, some of the things that Pope Francis has said or, you know, taught or whatever, you know, mo- most notably, you know, obviously what we mentioned before, Amoris Laetitia, you know, it's, it's some, some have proposed, I've not heard this from any church leaders, but I've heard it from some prominent lay Catholics that, you know, it's like the cardinals should do something about, you know, do something about it if Pope Francis will not address some of these questions that he's raised in some of the teachings that he's given and stuff like that and i mean when i when i heard some of those things you know instantly concealerism kind of came to my mind at that you know at that point because you know obviously you know then you would be talking about the cardinals acting independently of the pope maybe even you know doing like a council like session not saying that they would call a council but they would do something similar to that um so it's like you know it, you know, and so let's put forward just a worst case scenario. Let's just say that, you know, there, that we have a Pope, not, you know, just a- any Pope who, you know, would, you know, does do something very controversial that seems to be at odds with church teaching, you know, it's like whether they say it in an apostolic letter or something like that is like, what, is there anything that the Cardinals could do in that particular case without falling into conciliarism or, you know, or is it something where, you know, it's like, you know, we, we kind of have to just, you know, roll with the punch and just try to bring the best out of it that we can? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think that, 
you know, it's there's there is. I mean, I think there's some things that can be done. I think that that you know, cardinals or bishops, you know, need to be very careful <laughs> when they when they do these kinds of things. Um, you know, because there 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 is an, an easy slide, I think, into or there could be an easy slide into conciliarism. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to get all the cardinals together, or even some of the cardinals together in a location or at a specific meeting, and you know, start talking about well, you know, the pope is teaching erroneously, and we need to get rid of him, and this. I mean, there's you know that that can lead to all kinds of significant and serious um, serious issues and problems. Uh, I mean, I think in terms of what they could do. I mean, I think, and this is what I think some cardinals have done, at least in the in the current case. Um, you know, they could speak privately with the Pope about their concerns. Um, that should be the first um, option, really, in terms of instead of taking things to the media or taking things to the laity um, and kind of you know uh, creating a situation. Rather, you know, go and talk with the Pope privately about what he has taught or what he is proposing to teach, asking him for clarification, um, realizing again that, you know, the Pope can provide clarification if he wants or but doesn't necessarily have to provide clarification either. Maybe he doesn't want to provide cl clarification for some particular reason too. Who knows? Um, but they should definitely – speak with him privately uh, if the situation was really serious and significant i mean perhaps they could you know they could take their their concerns public um and, and try to you know uh, involve the the larger church you know in a discussion and maybe put some level of pressure i guess maybe on the pope to clarify some things um you know the pope or the cardinals and bishops themselves need to continue obviously to teach uh, correct doctrine uh, you know, maintain their orthodoxy, may preserve their communion with each other and with with the Holy Father, um, but obviously continue to to teach in an authentic manner. Uh, you know, some things that they cannot do, we talked about, was they can't publicly call for the Pope's removal. Um, you know, that leads to, I think, um, that's that's really schism, frankly. Um, but also, you know, if calling you can't really call for an ecumenical council to resolve. The issue either because that definitively is a considerist uh, perspective, um, you know, and some unfortunately some sometimes the laity can get involved or can can kind of slide into that as well. I mean, I remember, you know, during the height of John Paul II's um, pontificate, there were many Catholics. Uh, I shouldn't say many. There were some Catholics. I remember in the United States, in particular, that were um, again bad bad term, but at least it's something that we can use. Um, to, to kind of characterize the group, you know, more of a more liberal bent, um, who didn't like some of the things that he was teaching, uh, who were, I remember this, you know, Claire's Day years ago, they were calling for an ecumenical council, you know, Vatican III to be held to kind of undo some of the things that John Paul II was teaching and this and that. And again, that that is definitively a conciliarist position. You cannot uh, place, you know, uh, the authority of the church into the, the grouping of bishops assembled in ecumenical council. That's not what. That's not the purpose of an ecumenical council, uh, or or the authority of a council either in in those situations. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. That 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 makes a lot of sense because you know it's like you, you mean there there is definitely a fine line that has to be walked here because you know it's like you have to respect the papal authority. You know, and, and you know, and in many in many different cases, and you know, and you know, and it kind of you you kind of uh, draw off some of the things that uh, Christ mentioned in the Gospels, where he says, like, uh, I I paraphrasing the the Bible verse here, but he says basically, he's like, if your brother has a fault, you go talk to him privately. He's like, if he won't listen to you, then bring two or three more and discuss the fault with him again. If he will not listen to you, then take it to the church. He was like, and if he will not listen to the church, then there's a problem. You know, basically, yeah. and that and that kind of ties into the next question that I wanted to ask here, which is, you know, like, you know, <clears throat> you know, some members of the laity. Again, I have not heard any church leaders call for this, but some members of the laity have put forward a scenario where the cardinals will need to preserve the integrity of the faith, and that's the quote they use. Um, but they will need to preserve the integrity of the faith by telling the faithful that the current pope is a bad pope and he must be resisted for the good of the faith. Now, I know personally looking at that statement, I've, I, I'm, I'm kind of in a position where I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's like if you had a pope who was really, you know, messing up, and, we've, and the church has had bad popes. I'm not denying that the church has had bad popes. I'm not saying that I don't think we've had any in recent history. But, you know, we have had bad popes in the past. And, 
you know, it's like, and there have been scenarios where the popes have done things where, you know, we, you know, the, the faithful Catholics cannot approve of. And so, you know, just going off of that, of that point there, and I'm talking not just in terms of, you know, it's like Pope Francis here, but also, you know, maybe any successors he might have down the road. It was like, is this situation that, that I just laid out, you know, where the cardinals say, you know, to preserve the integrity of the faith, you know, the faithful, you know, must understand the current pope is a bad pope and must be resisted for the good of the faith. It's like, is this theologically plausible or is this solution really more in the conciliarist bent? Because, I mean, you know, building off what you mentioned, you know, earlier in our discussion about Pope Urban VI and the beginning of the Great Western Schism, it seems like what they're proposing is very similar to what happened with Urban and the Great Western Schism. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really see how you can, uh, you know, take a position that's in this in that situation that there would be anything other than conservatist. Frankly, I mean, you know, uh, for people to, for cardinals or you know to come up and say, you know, this the pope is it needs to be resisted, and um, you know, for me, I think that that. Uh, you know that that's very, very, very problematic. Obviously, very clearly leads to conservatism. Could very much lead to a situation where you have anti-pope, an anti-pope. And again, you know, we've had multitudes of those. You know, there've been a number of those, I should say, throughout the history of the church. I and mean, we haven't had one in quite a long time. But um, you know, so the church has has dealt with that situation before, where you have somebody who disagrees with uh, what the pope is doing. I mean, a classic example is the very first anti-pope is Saint Hippolytus back in the fourth century. Um, you know, where Hippolytus disagreed with the Church with the with the popes the current the pope of the times um, uh, you know uh, his his view of of uh, welcoming back those who had lapsed during the persecution right many many Catholic, or some Catholics had given into the Roman persecution persecution ended or subsided for a period of time and then they wanted to come back to the church and there were two different camps right in church history over that there was in the early church there was one camp that said after a if they were truly contrite and after a period of penance you know these people could be uh, you know welcomed back into membership of the church even though they had given in during the persecution there was another group uh, that Hippolytus was a member of that said no you know, these people cannot become, they cannot come back to the church. You know, they were called the rigorists. Uh, you know, they, once you leave, once you've, you've apostatized during the persecution, you know, you're done. You can't come back. Uh, and the Pope at the time disagreed with that, and he chose the merciful tr uh, tract, so to speak. And Apollos was upset, so he had his followers elect him Pope. Um, you know, and he was an anti-pope. Eventually, he's known as Saint Apollos. Just to close the story on that, is because he actually he was rounded up with Saint Pontian, the pope at the time. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, Hippolytus was pope, or he was anti-pope through, uh, I think, three different popes. So he was anti-pope for a significant period of time. Um, and anyways, he and Pontian were both uh, rounded up during one of the persecutions and sent to the mines of Sardinia. And while he was there, uh, he saw Pontian, who was the obviously validly elected pope. He decided to uh, renounce his his papacy, you know, to to be welcomed back into uh, the the bosom of the church, so to speak. He acknowledged Pontian as the validly elected pope uh, and then the two of them died on the mines and so that's why they're he's recognized as saint napolitus he's the only pope only anti-pope i should say rather in church history who's also considered a saint so um you know but his i think his story is kind of classic there right where it's it, you, i disagree with the pope's policy so i'm just gonna you know uh, have my followers elect me pope or i'm just going to disagree with what the, what the pope is teaching and so i'm going to you know follow some other some some cardinal that i like and you know tell him you know that he needs to become pope or something like that i mean it's 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 you know again i think that that's that's a position that's not uh, appropriate and one especially as a catholic for for us to take um you know we've, we've talked about it we've had immoral popes in the past um, we've had popes that think, you know, again, by the grace of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, rather, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, that no pope has ever taught anything doctrinally that was uh, erroneous, um, you know, that we've been preserved through that. There have been some close calls, <laughs> you know, but uh, but the church has been preserved from that, that, uh, that situation. And I, I would have to think, and I think we have to place our faith and trust in the Holy Spirit, that that would continue in the future. Yeah, I, the, I I would agree with you there. I mean, it's, it's because you know it's like you you got it. I mean, there is a reason that God asks us to you know have the gift of faith because there are going to be times where you know it's like we're going to have to just have faith that God's going to pull through it. You know that everything's going to be okay. 
you know, you know, in times to come and stuff like that. And actually building off that point, um, you know, you mentioned that we've had some close calls, you know, but God has, you know, has protected his church from threats of heresy. Uh, there's one case in particular. I mean, like, I, I, I know I just love this story, but seeing as you know more about it, I would love to hear you, you, you tell it. Uh, would, would you tell our audience about the story of uh, Pope Vigilius, uh, who, you know, amazingly enough, was an anti-pope who became pope, and not only that, when he became pope, he seemed to be endorsing a heresy. And in fact, uh, he got the support that he did, you know, from somebody who, from a, a, a ruler who was trying to get the church to approve of a heresy. You know, but the Holy Spirit saved the church from that scenario. Would you go into that story for us? Yeah, so so Pope, uh, you know, Vigilius was uh, a pope in in the the sixth century, and so he he came to the papacy during a time of of you know great theological controversy. Uh, you know, this is during the the early, still part of the early church time frame when you had uh, these early councils in the church's history. You know, defining how we understand who Jesus is, right? How he relates to the Father, how he relates to the Holy Spirit. Does is he two persons? Is he one person? Does he have two natures? Does he have one nature, they have two wills, one will. I mean, all these different questions were, were kind of raging in the time of the, uh, the sixth century here. And so the, the the secular ruler, the emperor at the time, Justinian, Justinian the Great, rather, um, wanted to, you know, kind of stop the theological controversies, wanted to bring unity to the empire, you know, uh, not dissimilar to what Constantine did with the Arian heresy back in the fourth century. But Justinian wanted this all to end. So he, um, proposed that he wanted to issue an edict that he thought would would help bring about the the orthodox or the nicene uh, group uh together with a group known as the monophysites right the monophysites were a heretical group of christians that were condemned at the council of chalcedon earlier in the in the fifth century um and the monophysites had proposed that that Jesus only had one nature, that he was one divine person with one nature, a divine nature, his human nature kind of being absorbed, so to speak, by the divine nature. And obviously the orthodox position of that is that's not true because if we say as we do in the creed and we proclaim that Jesus is true God, true man, he has to have a uh, uh, you know, has to have an actual human nature. Um, so that, but that was the controversy at the time. And so, Justinian decided that he would bring about unity between the Orthodox and the uh, Monophysites by um, condemning uh, these three theologians. They're known as the Three Chapters. And condemning these three theologians who had been friends of a, uh, a previous heretic, a man by the name of Astorius. So, anyways, he he issued this edict and wanted the Pope in Rome to support his edict. Uh, the Pope at the time was Agipatus I. Uh, he refused to accept uh, this edict. Eventually he died when he was visiting Constantinople and Vigilius happened to be the papal representative in Constantinople. And so Vigilius was an individual who um, was really kind of focused on being Pope. He's one of those, those men we talked about earlier who really wanted to be Pope um, and so probably wouldn't be a good pope or wasn't a good pope in some ways because he wanted the office so badly. Um, but while he was in Constantinople, he actually ingratiated himself to the empress, uh, Justinian's wife, who was Theodora. Um, and she was a monophysite sympathizer. So she was a, sympathy, a sympathizer of this heresy. And so he it, – it, you know, he kind of passed himself off as being this, you know, monophysite sympathizer, sympathizing with heresy because he knew that that would help him achieve his ultimate objective of getting her support of, of becoming pope. So anyways, Achipatis, the pope, is in Constantinople. He dies. Vigilius is, goes back to Rome, you know, accompanying the body of the dead pope back to Rome and fully expecting that when he gets back to the city, he's going to be elected pope. Um, you know, but the, uh, the you know the, the the bishops gather and the, the clergy uh, or the cardinals they, or the cardinals of the time, but the the, um, uh, the clergy gather, the people gather, and they elect uh, not not uh, Vigilius Pope, but they elect another man, uh, Silverus. And so, you know, Vigilius is obviously very upset. He goes through and get into more detail, but he gets into these all these political uh, man, uh, machinations with the Byzantine general, General Basilius, uh, who's there trying to reconquer Byzantine territory from the German ethnic German tribes who had conquered it. And so he has Silverius um, basically arrested and then sent into exile, and then he's released, but then he's arrested again and sent into exile. And eventually, he dies. Um, and all this is. is 
is kind of, you know, again, the political maneuverings of Vigilius so that he can be made pope. And so eventually he is made pope when Samaris dies. Um, and so now that he's pope, right, this is where – this is, I think, the beautiful part of the story where we're as pope, right, the grace of the office and the gift of the Holy Spirit kind of comes in and preserves him from – from doing something really stupid or from, you know, embracing heresy. So, you know, once he's Pope now, Justinian sends uh, Vigilius the edict, um, you know, condemning these three theologians and which he thought would bring about unity between the Orthodox and the Monophysites, but it doesn't because these three theologians had actually been exonerated at a previous council. And so the Orthodox saw Justinian's edict as really embracing monophysic, uh, you know, monophysicism, which they was a heresy, so they weren't going to do that. So he sends the edict to um, Vigilius, who you know, demurs initially, right? Kind of refuses to, he doesn't outright refuse, but he, he kind of just puts it off and doesn't, you know, doesn't answer the emperor, doesn't really sign it, doesn't do anything with it, just kind of ignores it. Um, eventually he's arrested um, by Justinian and sent to Constantinople where he tries to, pre the emperor tries to pressure him into signing the edict. Eventually he does issue um, kind of a, a judgment against these three theologians, but he clarifies that by issuing that judgment, he is in no way, shape or form condemning the previous councils who had condemned monophysitism. So, uh, you know, but there's some so Western bishops that are upset by what he does. Eventually, an ecumenical council, he proposes that an ecumenical council be called to, to solve the issue once and for all. It finally meets in the year 553. It's the second council of Constantinople. Um, and the situation is resolved by the three theologians. Their, their heretical writings are condemned. Um, but the teachings of Chalcedon and Ephesus, which had taught that Jesus is one divine person with uh, two natures, a human and divine nature, is upheld. Uh, and eventually, um, Vigilius is released uh, and to go back to Rome, but on his way back to Rome, he dies. So that's a, it's a very interesting story with a lot of different kind of moving parts and all kinds of things going on. But ultimately, it proves that, um, you know, this, the, the, I think that the Holy Spirit, you know, protects the church, right? Uh, guides the church, preserves the church, preserves the Pope in particular from error. Uh, so that even if you have someone who is um, either immoral, you know, it's necessarily the case with, with uh, Vigilius, but someone who is, is uh, you know, focused on, uh, you know, the political aspects of the papacy more than the spiritual aspects of the papacy, let's say, uh, or even someone who is confused or is easily manipulated or, um, you know, might be susceptible to pressure to try to do things. I mean, in, in those cases in the papacy throughout the history of the church, we've seen where the Holy Spirit has stepped in, right? Either the Pope is prevented from doing something because of, uh, you know, other people stepping up and, and, and protecting him or, you know, and um, seemingly untimely death or other things, um, you know, the Holy Spirit does, does, you know, guard and protect the church as Christ, uh, you know, had, had intended, right? Christ sent the spirit to be with the church to do that precisely. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean, that I mean, I know that when I heard that story, and especially the uh, uh, the the rebuff that Vigilius sent to uh, the Empress Theodora when she basically called to you know cash in her investments, so to speak, yes. <laughs> to use a secular term, it was like you know, I I don't remember the quote verbatim, but he basically told her he said he said I spoke wrongly before. He said yes. I, I spoke. He said I spoke wrongly. He said I am the successor of. The two previous popes who condemned this heresy, and I will continue to do so. Again, I'm paraphrasing there, but you know that that rebuff was just—I mean, you, you you could almost sense the Holy Spirit's response in that rebuff, that the Holy Spirit's inspiration in the rebuff that He sent there. And you know, and and like you said, it's such a beautiful story, just showing how you know God is with the Church even in its darkest hours. And that truly, I mean, that that particular. Uh, uh, scenario at that time was one of the church's darkest hours because it, it seemed like the heresy had triumphed there at that time but you know, oh yeah so yeah and you know it's like and you know bill bill you know, going off that story just a little bit uh you know and, and this is kind of some of the final points i just want to make here uh there was an article uh published not, not too long ago and this is what kind of got me started thinking about this uh, topic about conciliarism and you know uh, all these 
uh, scenarios being proposed, you know, if the, you know, can the Pope be a heretic and so on. And there was an article here from uh, Crisis Magazine. It was published about uh, three years ago. And, uh, you know, at the height of, you know, all this controversy, you know, this uh, controversy between Cardinal Burke and Pope Francis over, you know, the the synod and the marriage and the family and so on. And in this article, which was, uh, ironically enough, is written by a professor. He's, uh, I, I believe he's part of the staff at, uh, or he was at the time, of the uh, one of your uh, competitors in the Catholic world of education at uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, uh, his name was uh, Jacob Wood. And he basically lays out that uh, there has been discussion theologically on if the Pope can become a heretic and what happens in that scenario. And, you know, he quotes, you know, a couple Jesuits on that point, but the one that uh, he quotes in particular, which I, who I think holds more weight because he has been proclaimed a saint of the Roman Catholic church is Robert, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine. And basically uh, St. Robert Bellarmine basic, basically put forward the scenario where he said, in the unlikely event that a pope formally endorses heresy, the papal office is vacated by him becoming a formal heretic. I, I, I hope I'm using the correct theological term there, uh, where he becomes a formal heretic. By doing so, he has separated himself from the church and therefore has vacated the papal office, and therefore the cardinals may then elect a new pope. Now, that scenario being presented, some people who may, who, you know, may know a little bit about conciliarism and so on, may want to know, he's like, you know, it's like, well, what's the difference between that and conciliarism? You know, it's like, what theologically is the difference? It was like, and when would that scenario actually be able to be put into effect in the worst possible what-if scenario? Again, we know this is unlikely, as we've just laid out, because the Holy Spirit has protected the church. But in the unlikely event that were to happen, you know, like, well, how is what St. Robert Bellarmine proposes, how is that different than the uh, heresy of conciliarism? Yeah, so I mean, to, to uh, great question, and and uh, yeah, Professor Wood's article is is quite fascinating, um, and he lays things out very nicely. I think in there, what what uh, Suarez and and Bellarmine uh, talk on this issue. And one of the things he points out, that I think it's important, is that you know Bellarmine uh, said that he he believed that it was com you know it was very very improbable uh, that that the situation would happen, right? Uh, that he believed that God would actually. Um, you know, kind of prevent a pope, so to speak. Like we were just talking about with with Vigilius, that the pope or that the God, the Holy Spirit, would prevent the pope from actually falling formally into heresy. Um, and and you know, to be frank, I mean, heresy, falling into it or, or embracing heresy, um, you know, outwardly, formally that way, would be extremely difficult, I think, for um, a pope, right? Because I mean, heresy is is a pope, it's a post rather uh, uh, baptismal denial of a of a doctrine of faith, right? So and has, it's a willful denial. So it's an obstinate post-baptismal denial of a basic doctrine of faith. So one has to be, you know, obstinate, willful in in their. Um, it's not like you know uh, you misspeak or something, or the pope uh, misspoke, or he, you know, uh, is not clear or as precise as he should be on something. I mean, that's not necessarily heresy, right? <laughs> you has to be an obstinate. You have to be willful. It has to be manifested that way. Um, and so, you know, that again, hard to I think for for a pope to to be in a situation like that. And Bellarmine actually believed that it would it was very nearly impossible. But if you know, in the, in the great hypothetical, what if if something like that were to happen and the see was vacated because the pope fell into formal heresy, um, you know, could the cardinals elect a new pope? You know, Bellarmine said yes, but he was also. Um, you know, quick to point out that it really wasn't then, I mean, it, that seems on the surface to be considerist, but it wouldn't be in that very specific hypothetical case because the Pope, by embracing formal heresy, has really kind of removed himself right from the church has, has is no longer really a member. I mean, a heretic is not really a member of the church anymore. They've, they've excommunicated themselves from the church by the obstinate you know denial of this of this of this basic doctrine of faith and so all the cardinals would be doing in that particular case right is is exercising their authority to elect a pope and, and making really known um you know what 
not it's not really their own judgment right they're not they're rather they're kind of making known and certain that god's judgment that this 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 pope had fallen into heresy um had been judged by god right and so therefore is outside of the church outside of of the faith had vacated the office because of the formal heresy they're just acknowledging that that has happened uh, and electing a new pope, which they had, the, which they would have the authority to do, because the see would technically uh, be vacant. So it's not, and it's different from conciliarism in that because conciliarism takes a situation where you have a validly elected pope who has not embraced, uh, you know, has not become a formal heretic, has not been, you know, really judged by God to to be the heretic and to be outside of the communion of the faith and outside of the office. But rather, conciliarism decides that on their own authority, not on the authority of God, but on their own authority, they're going to depose a validly elected pope uh, and, and, and appoint a new one. Or, again, you're going to place the authority of the church in this ecumenical gathering uh, of the bishops rather than the pope himself. Uh, so that's the distinction there. Okay, yeah, very fascinating, very fascinating. Because it, you know, it's like, it, it's a very... Uh... It, it's a very unique distinction. I mean, if if I could uh, just pour forward a hypothetical scenario, maybe you know, to relate to uh, maybe some of our listeners who are you know in Western countries, it would be almost as if, uh, let's say, the the American president were suddenly to defect to some defect to South Africa or something like that. Well, technically, he's vacated the office of the presidency because he's renounced his American citizenship in doing so. You know, is it, it would be the same thing with a pope who would formally endorse heresy. He's basically defecting from the church, and so therefore, if you're defecting from it, you can't technically be part of it. There, therefore, you can't lead it. Would you know? Would you agree with that? You know, kind of uh, analogy there. Yeah, I like that's a very good analogy. Actually, that's a good way of of, of putting it. Yep. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> and uh, and just want to. Um, and, and just you know, as we go forward, you know, it's like you know, obviously, as you stated before, the the, the church is the, the church has faced several storms throughout her life. Some more serious than the ones we're facing now. Some less serious. It was like, and there are going to be more storms that affect the church in the years to come. Is like, and but you know, it, obviously, uh, in a lot of this, you know, like the, the cardinals have to, the cardinals and bishops have to deal with church politics in addition to, you know, the spiritual teaching and stuff like that, because obviously. The church, like Christ, is both human and divine. There is the human element, you know, and uh, and it's and it's very and but you know what I think what one thing that you know a lot of you know uh, everyday Catholics, you know, the laity would really want to know is that you know it's like yeah, it's like we all understand that this scenario is incredibly unlikely, but it was like you know, it's like how do we go about you know and i think this could also be applied in some ways to you know some of the scenarios that we had with uh you know maybe priests who are problematic bishops who are problematic or something like that it's like how do faithful catholics go about you know respecting the pope while remaining doctrinally faithful if you know like i said in the unlikely scenario that there were to be a great controversy you know and stuff like in you know sometime in the future, you know, and stuff like that in the church. I mean, how do you see that uh, Catholics being able to do that? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, we've talked about it, I think, in some ways, uh, you know, throughout the, the interview here in terms of pre at least going back to that one comment I made about presuming the good, right? We have to presume the good of, of you know, our, our priests, of our bishops, of, uh, you know, of the pope and um, not always be on a heightened sense of, of suspicion, right, or a heightened sense of, of uh, you know, smackdown, ready to, uh, you know, the smallest slip up or this or that to, to freak out about various things here. Um, um, so there's that, but I also think you know. I mean, I mentioned earlier Lumen Gentium when we were talking about the charism infallibility. I mean, if if you know if anyone's interested, you know, your listeners can go and read L Article 14 of Lumen Gentium talks about how one is Catholic, right? Um, and and how we maintain membership in the faith. I mean, obviously, one becomes Catholic through baptism, right, and becomes a, a member of the family of God and uh, you know brother uh, and sister of the Lord. Um, but there's more to it than just baptism. Right. I mean, that's kind of like the formal entry into the church. But then uh, we're not just Catholic because we say we are. Right. I mean, we, we notice that or we know that with many um, you know public Catholic figures in the world today, especially many politicians who say they're Catholic, but then they don't you know either vote or 
live their lives in accordance with with the church's teachings. So just because you call yourself Catholic doesn't mean you are one, right? You need to. Um, uh, there's certain things that Article 14 of Lumen Gentium talks about, like external signs and internal signs that we need to manifest in order to maintain membership in the church. That you know we have to profess the apostolic faith, right? With the faith that we we uh, we profess each Sunday in solemnity uh, and the creed uh, at Mass, right? We need to live the sacramental life. We have to be obedient to the magisterium, which really comes into the conversation we were having today. Lumen Gentium, you know, talks about again. A faithful Catholic is one who's obedient to the magisterium, one who, um, again, presumes that the truth rests with the magisterium, presumes the good of those whom God has called uh, to be you know, in the ordained ministry uh, to serve the people of God. So we have to be very cognizant of that right, and maintain our membership in the church by being obedient. Uh, and that doesn't mean being you know, docile. Obedience isn't necessarily you know, uh, just kind of – sitting around and you know nodding our heads and being you know uh, unthinking robots that's not what that means i mean it means what we all that we've talked about tonight right that we we have to um uh, presume the good, presume the truth in the magisterium, but then we also have to, if we question things or we have, uh, you know, difficulty accepting a certain teaching or a certain saying or, or a certain policy even that the, you know, the pope is pursuing that we disagree with. I mean, there's room for legitimate and honest disagreement in some areas, in some cases, um, but we need to do that obviously charitably, and that's the last aspect that Lumen Gentium talks about of how one is Catholic is an internal sign of how one manifests. Internally, a spirit of charity. One must persevere in charity uh, in order to remain towards others, right? Especially those in the church, to um, to to remain actually really a member of the church in accordance with uh, with that document. So, all that's extremely important, and I think in many ways we have to. I think we've we've touched on this tonight as well that we need to just be cognizant of of not. Um, you know, kind of feeling that we are somehow, you know, more orthodox, right, or more holier, as you put it, than the Pope, right? I mean, we need to recognize that uh, there's that that great Finery O'Connor called it the great, you know, Catholic writer and author called called it uh, the greatest Catholic sin is is uh, smugness, right? Having this this sense of smugness about us that we are somehow, you know, better. We know more than the Pope. We know more than this bishop. We know more than that priest, or uh, you know, or we're better than this group or that group. I and mean, we have to be careful of that. We have to have a, an attitude of humility um, about our faith and recognize that it's a great gift. And not only is it a great gift, but it's a great responsibility. Um, and we need to uh, do the best that we can, you know, through God's grace, recognizing our own sinfulness of, of preserving unity uh, in our faith, specifically through being obedient and respectful to uh, those whom God has called uh, into that ordained ministry and who exercise the teaching authority of the church. Very, very excellent point. I, I mean, and, and you're right. We have kind of touched on this all through. It, it really, it really comes down to being rooted in charity and having charity drive our actions as Catholics, rather than. I mean, we we should have basically charity should be trumping the politics and the and the personal disagreements in many ways. You know, it, it it could be kind of summed up in that way. Would you not agree? Absolutely. Yeah. That's you hit that right on the on the head there. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, just you know, if there were, um, if there are people who uh, would like to know, you know, basically more about this subject, I mean, could you, uh, would you mind sharing with us, you know, like, uh, you know, may, where they might be able to read some more of your works? And I know you, uh, you mentioned when we were talking uh, earlier before the show this evening that, uh, you know, that there there was a book you just uh, noticed that was coming out in the not too distant future on conciliarism and so on. Would you would you like to go into some of that with us, please? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I would I would highlight for you know anyone who's interested in the subject a little bit more is if you want a historical perspective, obviously on conservatism, um, I highly recommend you know getting and looking at Warren Carroll's um, History of Christendom series. Uh, they're very meaty books, just to, you know, as a, as a uh, way of, of warning to to readers, a disclaimer. Uh, they're very they're very meaty. There are a lot of a lot of uh, footnotes in them, but they're very detailed and excellent. So if you want to know the whole, you know, 14th century crisis in the papacy, I th I think it's volume three. It's either three or four of, of Warren Carroll's History of Christendom that talks about that uh, that whole historical context of of the Avignon papacy, the Great Western Schism, the rise of conciliarism. Um, I also like the one you just mentioned. I was looking at this um, 
academic journal that I'm a subscriber to. I'm a member of the Society for the Study of the Crusades in the Latin East, and the Society publishes a journal called – an academic journal called the Crusades uh, every year. And in the most recent volume that I have uh, that the Society published, there's a note in the back about uh, different members of the Society and, and books and things that they're working on. And Norman Housley, who's a great uh, crusade historian, uh, is coming out with a work that he entitled – at least it's mentioned in the bulletin here – called uh, Concilarism and the 15th Century. So um, that I'm sure will be a fascinating look at what followed the – probably he's going to talk about, I'm sure, the Council of Constance, what happened there, the decrees that came out from the Council of Constance that, seemed, that called for a kind of a frequent occurrence of councils, um, which never really materialized in the history of the church. But um, you know, I'm sure he's going to look at the politics of that and the history behind that and what happened there. So that would be another interesting uh, uh, resource for those um, – who would want to look into that in more detail. And then uh, for personally, you know, from my own perspective, I, I uh, have written several books, but one I think that talks – one that I know has, has a whole section on the papacy and covers some of the things that we talked about tonight uh, is uh, my most recent book by Catholic Answers. It's called The Real Story of Catholic History, Answering 20 Centuries of Anti-Catholic Myths. Uh, and in that book, I have a whole section on papal myths and the papacy as well um, that readers might find interesting. And you can get that on Amazon or through Catholic Answers. Excellent. And if uh, and if people were to uh, want to, you know, basically f uh, fo follow what you're up to and just follow new releases, I'm sure as a professor, you've probably got uh, more, you know, more uh, book projects running around in your mind. You know, where where could they where could they go to like follow you and just keep up to date on some of the writings that you do and you know maybe some of the future books you might have coming out. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, I do have a, a book that will be coming out this fall. It's a one-volume history of the church called Timeless, a history of the Catholic Church. It's going to be published by Our Sunday Visitor, and uh, I do talk about considerism in that book. So <laughs> you can you can look at look at the, into that when that comes out later on this year. Um, but to follow me around, yeah, just go to I'm on Facebook, so it's just um, Steve Widenkoff on Facebook, and then I'm also on Twitter, you know, at s Widenkoff. Uh, and one can always go to the Christendom College uh, website. Uh, you can see the undergrad campus is at christendom.edu, and the graduate campus is graduate.christendom.edu as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, Steve, this, is, <laughs> I, this, this has been a, a very fascinating conversation. We're, we're definitely going to have to have you back here some, sometime soon to talk about a couple more issues because I, I, I know as, I was, as we were talking here this evening, there were a couple other topics that – came up that I was like, you know, I was like, we could do a whole podcast on that, on this topic or that topic, you know, it's like, cause you know, <laughs> I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, the, the Protestant revolt and how the great Western schism led to that, you know, it's like, that would be a fascinating topic to discuss. And it's like, and, uh, you know, like, and actually another topic, I know we don't, we didn't have time to go into it tonight, but I, w I would like to discuss it because I know this is something that's been thrown out quite a bit. Uh, the issue of uh, papalatry or the worship of the Pope so to speak, you know, it's like that. I think that would be something that uh, that would be very, very interesting to just, you know, go into and discuss, you know, and try to draw the line to equivocate. So, well, I, mean, I mean, would you be willing to uh, maybe in a future, uh, you know, not too distant future to, you know, uh, join us again sometime? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. I enjoyed the conversation a lot tonight. So absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And, uh, and uh, thank you for coming on board. And we will talk to you again very soon. Yeah, great. Thank you, Grant. Uh, have a good uh, have a good evening, and God bless. God bless. All right. Well, I hope you guys really found that episode to be educational. I know I sure did, especially in this very confusing time. Keep tuned here for the next couple of weeks. We're going to have some really fascinating episodes on a variety of different topics, like fake news, foreign affairs. I'm also going to see if I can get another historian on board and talk about the Cold War. Don't go anywhere. Please keep tuned here for the next couple of weeks and months. Remember, the solution to today's problems always begin with you and your community. Till next time, folks.